film with us, and we're really happy to be here. Um, just a quick update on Tim. He's currently in a halfway house in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he's set to be released April 21st of this year. So we're actually doing, and Lauren will speak to this a little bit more, but uh, we're doing a big Earth Day release at Fitter 70 all across the country with groups showing community screenings. Um, he also just applied for the Harvard Theology School, so we're crossing our fingers that he will actually um, be a Harvard graduate and a felon at some point in the near future, <laughs> which is like a pretty unique uh, resume to have, I think. So he's doing really well. Um, he is in Salt Lake City right now, and we're all excited to go back and see him soon. My name is Matt Leonard. Uh, I live, in, well not here, I live in Oakland, but the Bay Area. Uh, and I manage the U.S. Actions team at 350.org, uh, and also the honor of uh, being out of Tim's trial and, and knowing Tim for a number of years. Um, and a lot of our, the work that I do and a lot of the work we do at 350.org is uh, building a climate movement uh, that's global in scale and really uh, grassroots in nature that's commensurate to the problems that the climate crisis presents us with. Um, and specifically, the work that I do is uh, helping to mobilize communities um, with uh, you know, trainings and leadership development uh, to use tools like civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action effectively uh, to help build that movement uh, locally, nationally, and globally. And I am Dylan Schneider. I was uh, one of the beginning members of Peaceful Uprising, and then I was also acting as Tim's power of attorney while he has been incarcerated. So it's been fun to be able to travel with the film and be in touch with Tim. Uh, I'm Lauren, and I'm currently one of the um, board members of Peaceful Uprising, kind of one of the founders of the back in the day, uh, getting our hands dirty with some uh, grassroots organizing. Um, so we're still working hard at uh, trying to create a, a coherent climate narrative for the movement and for the nation by creating a really interesting uh, local narrative around the first ever tar sands operation in the United States, which is potentially breaking ground in Utah this summer. Um, so there'll be more, more to hear from that as, uh, as we move forward. But that's, that's kind of what we're organizing on right now and what I'm working on. Um, so yeah. Well, uh, I really thought I had if this was uh, a sort of the moment thing. So he was asked at the door accidentally, hey, are you here for bidding? And he just said yes. Is that just one that clear? Yeah, I think from every time he's told it to me, he didn't necessarily know that he was going to come into that, uh, which was originally a protest outside. Um, he didn't initially think that he was going to go in and disrupt an auction. He was merely trying to uh, show dissent in the ways in which we as citizens have been told uh, that it is appropriate to show dissent. Um, and recognizing the hopelessness in the amount of people in the street who were uh, protesting so ardently and falling on deaf ears, I think at that moment was compelled to take a step forward and try something else and at least engage with the authorities that existed. Um, and happen to see a really golden light opportunity to be able to really uh, change change the process as I still. Um, I think you know one of the important things you see in the film too is that even when Tim was in the bidding room and his he didn't exactly know if he was going to start bidding or not, it wasn't until he saw Krista crying that it was really that compelling moment where he made that decision of is it worth going and getting in trouble and like possibly facing a prison sentence, or is it worth sitting here and not taking action when I could? And, you know, most of the land parcels that he did bid on and stall are now protected in Utah, and they won't go back up for drilling. So, I mean, the action that he took was incredibly effective going forward into the future. Was he out bidding other bidders? Yeah, he was raising, I mean, that's the other thing about these oil and gas, these auctions, is, I mean, they were selling the lands for absolutely nothing. So he was not only winning the parcels, but he was driving up the price of those parcels that were being bought by other oil and gas lease bidders. So there's, there's no requirement for being a bidder? Anyone can go in and... I believe after this auction, some of those requirements <laughs> have been changed. <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, um, there was a time in the film he mentioned that uh, oil companies create jobs for people, and I'm just wondering if you guys have no personal knowledge of how he would respond to someone posing that opposition to him, and how do you respond to people, um, like maybe 350.org, how do you respond to people that, um, that, that do have that, that, that take that stance that, 
But I think it's going to be to give a little credit to the oil industry, which I'm very loath to do. The fossil fuel industry does create jobs. I mean, that's true. But there's an opportunity cost as well that by you know continuing to invest in that sort of industries and that sort of infrastructure, what opportunities are we missing out on? And I think it's uh, you know there's a ton of great research and studies that show that moving to a clean energy economy actually produces far more jobs. And so the, the longer we continue to invest in the the dirty fossil fuel industries of our past. We're actually holding back the potential to create far more jobs and far more economic benefit. I would argue in a far much more equitable way as well, to not just a handful of small you know, oil companies, um, but to a much broader swath of the economy in the middle class. Um, so I think that's probably the most the simplistic argument is that it's true, but we have better options on the table that create better jobs, better economic opportunity, and protect a you know, livable future. I was just curious how this whole process has changed you. I mean, obviously, Tim has been sort of in your head exhibited in the movie, but um, so much of this movement involves normal people um, that climate change affects every day. So did you anticipate that you were going to be involved in environmental issues and just sort of come out of the process? And on top of that, what would be, I mean, you think that if you give people the facts that they will respond and really care, but sometimes that doesn't seem the case. So, so I mean, for me, it was kind of an interesting case. Uh, I was actually living out here with all y'all in the Bay Area when Tim uh, bid on those auction parcels. And uh, being a homegrown Utah, um, it was a really interesting moment for me because I had come to the Bay with many hopes, some of which were to become more engaged in an environmental movement and to get uh, organized and activated by such an awesome, radical, progressive, cool community. Um, and while I did find that here, and many, many seeds of hope in this area, uh, I realized the strange pull in my gut that when Tim took that action, there was like this moment of hope that I could actually go back to a place where I was from that was a radically conservative state with radically oppositional politics to what uh, was in my heart's truth and feel like I actually had the ability to create change um, even in you know, flying in the face of the adversity that, uh, that is posed by our very strong political structures, uh, specifically in one of the most conservative states in the nation. So it was a really cool moment of opportunity. Um, and moving back to Utah and beginning peaceful uprising with a community of organizers that were willing to say, we're, we're going to take this stand, even though it means taking some risks in our own personal life and giving up some of our own personal privileges by you know, showing our face um, and saying these things was an incredibly liberating experience. Um, I thought it would, uh, you know, maybe hurt my chances of getting a, a cool career in the future, but in fact it has been a very liberating process in realizing that I have the ability to make change and honestly continue to create a ripple effect by having opportunities like this to talk to a bunch of college students and get more people engaged in, um, in activating. So it was a great moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think something like this can't not change you. And I wish there were more like it. I mean, I think the facts are incredibly important, but they don't move people like a human story does. And I think that's why Tim's story has actually touched so many people. And I know that, I mean, I've been working in human rights, and I had no interest in being an environmentalist. I mean, I kept hearing about the polar bears, and it was like, I, I get that, but I care about people right now, and it wasn't until I really heard Tim speak for the first time, and I actually made that connection between social justice and environmental justice, that it was like that light went on, and it was like, oh. And then being in a situation where we didn't know what we were doing <laughs> for like most of the time, and we had a great opportunity to have people like Matt Leonard and many trained organizers come in and show us the way, but for most of the time, we just kind of went out on a limb and built our wings on the way down. And that was so incredibly empowering. And it did, as you saw Dylan Hayes say in the movie, it made you feel like, oh yeah, I can make a difference. And I wish that more of this was happening so more people could feel that immediate action that happens when you do become powerful. Um, and I think if we all felt that or have ways to empower each other to feel that way, that we would be making even more headway than we are right now in this huge shift that we're in. I have a couple of questions. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, first of all, just to, to touch on what you just said about more of this happening so that we could feel 
powerful and engaged. Um, I want to say that, uh, first of all, I'm not a college student. I'm in my 40s, and like Terry Root in the film, I apologize to all of you because my generation was also part of the generations that screwed up, and so I'm sorry for that. I'm doing my part to fix it up. Um, before the Iraq War started, I spent $1,000 on a diesel van that I've been driving on recycled vegetable oil ever since. And that's something that any one of you can do. There's a biodiesel station here in San Francisco, so I recommend looking into that. I volunteer time to install solar panels for a group called Great Alternatives that install solar panels for low-income families in the Bay Area. I'm vegan, my partner is vegan, and we started this because of cruelty to animals, but we understand that there are multiple benefits, the number one being for the planet and methane is far, far, far more destructive to the environment than CO2. So I highly recommend you all go home and Google Animal Agriculture and Global Warming. You can check out the Facebook group for SF Vegans. If you want to ask me anything, I'll help you out. But back to the Tim to Christopher issue, I actually became interested in it because of the fact that he was arrested and he's an environmentalist trying to make a difference. I, of course, have a lot of friends who are vegans who are trying to make a difference for animals and we are being criminalized by our government. And I want to know what organizations that are involved with Tim's case and others are doing to make certain that activists like myself and the folks in this room who might be inspired by this can do to go out and, and speak and defend our planet, defend its animals, its resources, each other, without fearing being locked up and sent away to jail. It's terrifying, and I think as important as it is to make films like this and come out and show them and inspire people, we've got to be doing something else to let people know that we're not going to take this from our government. You know, uh, what's his name, the actor that was in the film? <coughs> Robert, thank you. <laughs> Robert Redford saying, you know, it's unconscionable. We're not putting away bankers that destroy the world's economy, yet we're putting away innocent kids who are just trying to stand up for their future. And I want to know, is 350 working on this? Are, are Tim's lawyers working on this? Are there any organizations working on saying this is unacceptable and we won't take it? Maybe. I mean, really briefly on that, I, I think to varying degrees, these organizations were involved in Tim's trial. Uh, maybe not necessarily on the ground in Utah, but certainly in helping uh, you know, raise the profile of it nationally. Um, but groups like the ACLU, to varying degrees, do a lot of great civil liberties defense work. Uh, the Civil Liberties Defense Fund, which is based out of Eugene, Oregon, does a lot of uh, work specifically with activists, uh, protecting First Amendment rights, uh, supporting activists who've been arrested justly or unjustly through acts of civil disobedience or otherwise. Uh, there's a lot of great activist legal support networks. Uh, the Bay Area is one of a lot of those. And, and emerging through Occupy, uh, there's the Occupy legal support team, uh, which works both in, both in Oakland and San Francisco. My roommate's a big part of that. Uh, that works well beyond Occupy, but to support uh, activists here in the Bay Area who are uh, interested in civil disobedience, who have participated in it, or who are dealing with legal consequences from, from demonstrating. Back there. Hi. Um, my question is a bit about Tim. How long has he been in federal prison versus how long he's been in the halfway house? And what does a day look like for him at the halfway house? What's he allowed to do, not allowed to do, and what kind of environment is he in right, right now? Um, so he was in federal prison from July 26, 2011 to February something, February 21st, 2013, <laughs> so about a year and a half basically he was in federal prison and he was transferred from starting in county jail in Salt Lake to um, a private prison in Nevada to Herlong up in Northern California and he spent his last few months in Inglewood, Colorado. Um, right now in the halfway house, uh, his normal day, he's actually working in a rare bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah, so, which is great. If any of you pass by Salt Lake before April 21st, you can take sandwiches to the rare bookstore and <laughs> lunch with Tim. Um, but so, I mean, he wakes up at the halfway house, he goes to the bookstore, he works, you know, eight to ten hours, and then um, he is allowed certain passes, and so um, I know he's allowed like a gym pass. Um, he's allowed to go home for 12 hours. He gets, you know, the, the farther up in the system he gets, the more time off he gets. And he's getting 24 hour passes to go home to spend with his girlfriend and his family, uh, friends. And then after April 21st, he'll be able to make his own schedule again and actually speak to the media, which is a big one. I heard about the story on uh, your call radio, public, tele, uh, public radio, it was Monday or Tuesday. And um, that's 
how I heard about this, but um, I was wondering, it seems like a story that the MSNBC, whether Rachel Maddow, Lawrence O'Donnell, Ed Schultz, uh, one of those shows, it seems like it would be a story that they would pick up on. I wonder, has, it, has, it, has this gotten much media attention nationally, or has it more been uh, a story in, in Utah? Um, and uh, was he charged, was this a felony or a misdemeanor? He was charged and convicted on two felonies. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I mean, during his trial, it was a huge national media story. Uh, front page of the New York Times, Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman has been amazing about reporting on it quite frequently. Rachel Maddow, I know, reported during the action. I don't know if she's kept kind of going afterwards. Um, and our goal is certainly to re-infiltrate the media on April 22nd and remind them of this story and inspire others um, to take action. Will yeah. he be doing a, a national tour when uh, he gets out, or, or what's the, what are his plans besides Harvard? Um, at this point, I'm not sure. I'm hoping he'll take a little bit of time to maybe just go on a river trip and spend some time in nature and <laughs> relax. Um, I know that he does have a couple speaking engagements that are being planned. I know that I think he's open. I know he's doing a lot of work with this film touring, and um, I think we'll just kind of see what happens when he gets out. I think he's not making any promises because he wants to see how he feels. I mean, the, the big thing that you saw is that the trial was postponed nine times. So for Tim, he hasn't had a normal life in four years. So I think a lot of us are encouraging him, like, yes, to speak out, but to actually get centered. Yeah, again. he certainly didn't get a speedy trial, so that is about the <laughs> Constitution. But, you know, I, I, my reaction to the movie was disappointment, uh, frustration, despondency. I, you know, I, I think about the various industries that have power over legislators. For instance, the gun control lobby has has 91 percent of the country wants uh, wants uh, 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 gun um, background checks. Background checks, uh, and yet legislators uh, in Congress refuse to take a vote. Uh, I mean, you got the the uh, bank the banking lobby and the oil industry, which is the most profitable industry in history, um, with power over legislators by via the money that they buy. Uh, influence. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing that, that, that's positive to me is that eventually the tobacco industry, their backs were broken. But I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very sanguine about this. Uh, the oil industry losing power anytime soon. So, you know, you you have the the bankers that walk away, Bush and Cheney that walk away with no accountability for their crimes, and yet people like this that that, go, that, that have noble causes. You know, going to jail, and I, I just wish that there was more um, attention to it. I want to make a quick plug on that. Um, you mentioned big tobacco. I think it's really uh, instructive, sort of that history of what took down big tobacco, which was a, a very powerful industry. Um, and Ashton mentioned earlier, but we do have an investment campaign happening here on campus, uh, and through Fifty.org is helping coordinate uh, national and, and soon to be international campaigns, working to get institutions to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Um, you know, to be really blunt, like the actual money that USF might have invested in the fossil fuel company is not going to dramatically impact their bottom line. But what it is going to do is start to really challenge and threaten the social license, the legitimacy, the credibility of that industry so that the stranglehold they have over lawmakers is weakened. So that when they introduce a bill in Congress that the industry has written, fewer and fewer politicians are willing to stand behind that bill because the public knows that that's a bill written by and for industry. Of dollars of subsidies every year. Mm -hmm. But how do we change that? Welfare. And even though, even though most of the population that knows about it is against it, the legislature refused to, to remove that uh, loophole. And that's why I think it's really upon us to build a movement that threatens their, their social license, their credibility, and make it so that they're, they now become an industry that, even if they're very wealthy and powerful, they become socially toxic to want to be associated with. And that's in many ways what took down big tobacco. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of the movements that uh, you know, 350 is helping to co-create, and many other organizations and peaceful uprising is is trying to advocate for is the idea that these institutions that we have built and relied upon have, to a large extent, failed us in some very key places uh, in our in our civic engagement and system. So this is a moment where. Maybe we need to stop asking our government to fix our problems and start co-creating the solutions to our problems with each other um, and building communities that are resilient and at the same time resistant to this change. Um, and so that's a slow process. That's a long, painstaking process to actually get together and maybe talk to all of your neighbors and talk to them about what's useful um, 
for them in their life, what's relevant for them in their life. But coming together and having those conversations um, is a really key place to start. And it's incredibly powerful when you actually start realizing that those around you care as well. And maybe with enough people together doing something, you can actually advocate and make some real change. That Democratic congressman that um, was uh, well, Democrats were voting, is he still in Congress? Yes. The woman that ran against him, I guess she lost. lost she forced him into a primary. But, but he lost. But, but she but lost. lost. I'd like to make a comment and then ask a question. Um, I've been involved with the Occupy movement almost since it started, and uh, so have a few other people in this country. And um, we're still around. Uh, still doing stuff Woo! for all members of Occupy, really. Um, so keep your ears open. I think we're preparing for Occupy, the sequel. Um, but um, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, I think that there are sort of two levels on which we need to act. The woman who was speaking about um, becoming vegan, I think that's really important. I think we have to take individual actions, uh, and, but I also think we have to work for structural change, uh, government and institutional levels, and I think both are important. You know, I sign online petitions, I give money to various organizations, but also getting out and um, hitting the streets, participating in protests, and taking very public actions, engaging in civil disobedience uh, is crucial. In fact, I don't think there are very many um, significant um, 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 leaps forward in the social justice that have been made without um, uh, civil disobedience. Um, and uh, I haven't been arrested yet, but that's partly because I'm Canadian and I'm about to apply for citizenship, partly so I can get arrested. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's also because I'm chicken shit, but I probably will take the, take the lead to get citizenship. Um, and uh, I, would, uh, I would also say that um, there are lots of great organizations that are currently working uh, on the root causes of a lot of these problems, which can mostly be traced to economic inequality. As far as Tim is concerned, I think, you know, he, he co-founded Peaceful Uprising and he will always be a member of Peaceful Uprising as far as anyone I know is concerned. Um, as far as him being an active organizer with us, I think he has his own path that he needs to create and, you know, bigger shoes that he needs to go fill and, and seeds to sow. Uh, so good on him, you know, we'll see, we'll see where he goes. But, as far as what we do and where we're continuing to work, um, we are finally launching into, uh, after four years, uh, a really big campaign um, to try and squash what looks like a, a small uh, squashable bug called U.S. Oil Sands, which is a Canadian corporation, ironically. Uh, sorry, Canada. But you know, they're the best at strip mining uh, tar sands, so they wanted to come down and start the first tar sands operation in great state of Utah, um, in one of the most arid regions in the nation, uh, hauling in tons of water. So I mean, it's just this horrendous, horrendous project uh, with a lot of uh, financial battles. And so um, we're looking towards being able to create a sustained resistance against that operation, which at this point has all but been green lighted to continue and, and break ground um, and show our state and the region and the nation that uh, wins are possible uh, when you're able to get a concerted effort of not just peaceful uprising, but a whole coalition of different organizations and national partners and, and people coming in to really uh, effect change and, and put our foot down and stop it really before it starts. So that's what we're up to at the moment. Uh, I became Medicare qualified uh, in February. <laughs> My two sons, who are 25 and 27, refer to me as an old fart. But I wanted to answer the question of how uh, Tim's actions and getting to know Tim over the last 40 months have impacted me. Uh, 45 years ago, tonight, Martin Luther King was killed. I was a sophomore at Stanford. I was working on Robert Kennedy's campaign. Uh, there really seemed to be an air of change. Uh, my father was a, a Archie Bunker. Uh, I was the first in the family to go to college. 
and everything I did, he was against, and everything he believed in, I was against. So it was like a immovable object meets uh, a rock or something. Uh, but we did, over the course of five years, uh, change things. And the one thing I wanted to emphasize tonight, civil disobedience really is the way social change happens. But the means of repression through technology and experience have become so great that it has to be, has to be coupled with nonviolence. Nonviolence is the only way that there is going to be social justice change. And it really takes an extraordinary amount of discipline in, it, in the gay, lesbian, transgender, uh, bisexual movement where people are beginning to say, well, yeah, that makes sense. And so I, I would urge you to think about how you can discipline yourself to confront evil, but confront it in a nonviolent way. And yet, at times, our Canadian friend can join us, be civil disobedient, and get arrested. That's what Thoreau taught us. That's what Tim DeGrisford taught us. So I think the film does a powerful job, and I really do consider myself lucky to have gotten to meet uh, people like uh, are standing here with me, because they really are the way of the future, and you're the way of the future. I think we had this gentleman right over here at first. Uh, well, one point to make is uh, <coughs> the difference between a misdemeanor offense and a felony, federal felony. That's right. Because that's, that's made him a marked person. I mean, you can go up whatever it is to write as a personal individual rights are prescribed for the rest of his life. Right. A conviction, which does not happen to a civil rights passive resistor, you know, anti-war activist, civil rights people. And, I was back in the civil rights and we were disciplined in Chicago, the University of Chicago, not to fight back, to defend ourselves. You know, the first instinct for a male, a young male, is to fight back. The second instinct is to run. The third part is to just sit there with the group, like you're part of the flock. You know, pick out the individuals that are going to get get out or arrested. And then you're you survive if you're the individual. Or you come back to the next demonstration. And it's the pressure of the mass that keeps the movements going. So I, I agree with you. This is civil demonstrations. And but not and that's the question I have in this film is that with the delay of the trial, um, did Obama do away with the Salazar uh, land grants? Uh, no, the well, was, was, the sequence was, was George Bush, to his people in the oil and gas industry, his supporters, were pushing. I, I was the former director of the Bureau of Land Management. Right. When I was the director, you had to put up a $100,000 uh, line of credit for a cashier's check before you could bid. And somehow, mysteriously, when the Bush people came in, that requirement went away because it was just too expensive for the oil and gas industry to have to put up that kind of credit. Uh, so, you know, they, they were thoroughly embarrassed by it. Uh, and then when Tim did what he did, they were truly shocked. And I tried behind the scenes to get Secretary Kenthorpe to agree that he would give Tim some kind of work-related punishment but not have a trial. And they waited until the Friday before the inauguration to turn that down. I met with him in Boise, and, and he said, well, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I think we can do it. But then in D.C., it's called a dinosaur age. So at the end of any administration, you want to put something down that the next administration has to take care of that you didn't want to have to address. So they knew that uh, the new Obama administration would have a really difficult political choice to free this lawbreaker or try to make some arrangements with the oil and gas industry who were not their friends. And uh, Salazar was a former attorney general, former prosecutor. Uh, so he did say that all the options were illegal. Uh, he removed the lands that were within five miles of the National Park because BLM had violated their own rules in that regard. We couldn't get any of that evidence into trial. And so, uh, you know, it just it went ahead. In fact, I saw an interview uh, 
Washington posted a story on Salazar who's leaving, and, and you know, I wish the reporter had said, well, what about that college kid who pointed out I was wrong, you know, and somehow amnesia who sat in uh, that way. Right. And so you, you just forgot. And yeah. You what, one other interesting fact is the price for, per acre before Tim started bidding was going to 5 or $10. It immediately went to $250 and went as high as $550. So the collusion that goes on in these bidding things is just outrageous. And it took somebody like Tim to do what he did. And it truly was spur of the moment. I mean, he turned around and saw uh, the crime going on. He turned around and started bidding, and he still didn't win any bids because he stopped just before they put down the auction gavel. And then he just got mad and, and said, I'm going to take him to 17 bids in a row. Is there any hope for a presidential pardon? Well, you know, after Bill Clinton uh, made a pardon, uh, the Congress, in its wisdom, now makes it you have to wait until five years after your sentence has been fulfilled before the president grand part. Uh, some of us are thinking we would challenge the constitutionality on separation of powers doctrine, but uh, we haven't uh, decided on, on any of that. What was the, uh, was the uh, sentence, uh, the verdict and the sentence of what you expected? Well, it's like Ron said, uh, you know, I practiced law for 37 years. One of the things I know is what I don't know. So I don't do domestic relations, I don't do tax. So Ron is probably the best criminal attorney in the Intermountain West. He uh, is a pretty cynical guy, as you get to be, and he actually thought near the end that Benson would do something good. Uh, now, Benson, you have to understand, was Orrin Hatch's chief of staff in the Senate. Then Orrin Hatch appointed him to be U.S. attorney, and then a deal was made between Senator Leahy, who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Senator Hatch, that, they, that Utah would get a fourth judge. And mysteriously, D. Benson was that fourth judge parole officer that we were talking to before the sentencing said he was in Judge Benson's chamber when Hatch called to say, give that young man 10 years. Really? Yeah. And uh, I got, I've gotten in trouble several times uh, because I've said that in the press. And, uh, <laughs> you think that's because Orrin Hatch was given pressure by the oil industry? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, actually, Tim and I had lunch yesterday, and, and I said, you know, the one, when I started talking to him, he says, now are you talking to me as my lawyer or as my pseudo-father? <laughs> and so I said, I'm talking to you as a lawyer. But, uh, no, I, th I think what it done, has done for me is make me more willing to take radical action uh, because I, I have seen uh, the effect of unlimited money in politics, and it's not a very pretty picture. So I'm sorry, I think our time is done, but we'll be around afterwards for questions. But I just really want to say thank you to Ashley Ruga for setting this up and to Human Rights Watch for having this and for all of you for being here. So thank you.